what questions or problems are you working to solve? 80% of the world's population lives in low and middle income countries. And we know that many of the people living in these countries have no access to medicines. And I think this is just baffling to me. And I think I think this is one of the main questions that, that I'm trying to solve, thinking that sort of in most cases, the place where you were born actually determines the kind of care that you will receive. In that in many cases, this might mean, and, and this happens a lot for many families living in low and middle income countries, sort of having to choose between buying food or buying the medicine that you need, right? Um, and I think the issue is very much here um, and, and the COVID-19 pandemic, it was a very powerful reminder that we still live in this world of, of have and have nots. And actually so many lives are being lost unnecessarily because access is not yet there. And on the other hand, we know that we are at a time where we're seeing so much progress, right? There is a lot of scientific innovation coming from the healthcare industry. We know that there are new technologies being worked on, um, new vaccines, new ways of treating cancers in children. However, this is genuinely pointless if people cannot really access these types of innovations and medicines, right? So in that sense, the pharmaceutical industry, as well as other healthcare sectors, they play a huge role in actually enabling access. And this is the main question that I'm trying to solve, uh, sort of how to meaningfully mobilize industry in access to medicine uh, to really deliver those treatments to the people who are very often at the back of the line when it comes to access. Uh, I work at the Access to Medicine Foundation, uh, where I lead work on uh, exactly these kinds of questions. Uh, we are a non-for-profit organization. We're based in the Netherlands. And what we try to do is to really guide industry to play their part when it comes to global health. Um, and for the last 10 years, we have done quite a lot of work uh, looking specifically at the role of the biggest innovative pharmaceutical companies um, and actually identifying the ways in which these companies can improve access and some of the actions that they're already taking. So, for example, imagine a company that has a diabetes drug in their portfolio and this drug is highly needed in a low and middle income country, but this company may choose not to really introduce that drug in some of the countries where maybe registration is a bit more difficult or maybe where, or actually preferring to do it in countries where the market is a bit more profitable, right? This is the kind of behavior that we would call out. But similarly, when we do see companies making efforts to say, use their research and development capacity to develop new treatments that are effectively, um, as, as they're like disproportionately affecting people in low and middle income countries. So think about neglected tropical diseases, for example, uh, companies making efforts to bring the products to the market, but also to price them affordably. This is the type of behavior that we would also reward and highlight, right? Um, and I think something that I'm very excited about is for the past year, I've been working on a new type of project. So uh, beyond the big pharmaceutical companies that we all know, uh, looking more deeply into the role of generic and biosimilar medicine manufacturers in access. Uh, this is something that so far has gone unexplored, I think, for many years. And traditionally, we have seen the generics industry obviously as an incredibly important player in making cheaper products available to populations. Also having this huge manufacturing footprint and scale to actually go into low and middle income countries. Uh, but we have also seen these companies um, having a, a bigger role in access, right? We've seen it through COVID. We, we've seen these companies actually partnering with big pharmaceutical companies to make patented treatments available in low and middle income countries, some oral COVID treatments, actually using their manufacturing capacity to reach more people that otherwise would not have access to, to this product. So um, some of the work that I'm doing now, and actually it's, it's very exciting that last week we published um, a new framework for identifying how these companies can contribute and something that we're gonna be using for evaluating and assessing uh, where they can go especially where uh, are the main areas where they can progress further into. Why have you chosen to pursue this question or problem? I mean, I think, I think maybe I want to answer this question in two parts. 
uh, maybe more on a personal side and also kind of the why I think this is an important question to pursue, right? So I always joke that kind of the issue around access to medicine sort of fell on my lap. It's, it's not something that I, I am trained as an economist. Um, I, I, I've worked as a management consultant for mining companies for quite a bit. Um, and, and actually this was not something that it was completely on my radar, but uh, in 2013, uh, my now husband and I, we quit our jobs. We went traveling. We went uh, to, to a couple of places, places in Africa to do some volunteering. And um, it was obviously a really great experience, but also very eye-opening for me, right? We were staying with a family that would ho was hosting us. And uh, long story short, uh, one day my husband starts developing the symptoms uh, that are very common to malaria. So you would have fever, chills, headache, muscle pain, all of these. Uh, the family that was hosting us uh, decided to really take us to the hospital to get, to get checked out. Uh, and I remember it being quite far. That was my, my, my first, it's like the hospital is quite far. We were in a very remote town, but it was just a long drive, you know? But I think what was most striking to me was First, my husband did not have malaria and actually I had it. So I was, I didn't have any symptoms, but I got tested and it was really straightforward in the sense that I was like, okay, I can access a treatment. For me, it's easy to access treatment and it's also fairly cheap. At the time, I remember it being less than four euros, you know, and only later on, I kind of realized that many people are actually not able to afford this. And, and this is something that really shifted my view and, and really opened my eyes to the inequity that happens in some countries for a disease that is not only life-threatening, but is also completely preventable and curable. There's a lot of people who are missing out, right? And I think this is just one example, and this really extends to many, many other diseases. And it's deeply unfair, right? And, and, and I think that was sort of one of the reasons why I feel that I spent quite a bit of my time just pursuing answers to these questions and trying to think a bit more deeply about what is it that we can do uh, as a community and as society in terms of enabling access. And it's not an easy question, but I think it's a worthwhile question. I think there has been incredible progress. We see sort of more companies embedding access to medicine into their work. We see a lot of momentum from governments, procurers, and other authorities to actually uh, make this happen, but we still need to progress further if we want to see this um, happening for everyone and not just for a few. As individuals and collectively as a society, what can we do to help answer the questions or solve these problems? Um, yeah, I think this is a great question to end on, actually, because I think many of the problems that we see in access to medicine, they cannot be solved by just one party alone. It really requires a multi-party solution, right? It's not enough for a pharmaceutical company to commit to better pricing or for making their products available in low and middle income countries. You do need governments and national regulatory agencies and procurers to also play their part, right? So I can give you maybe a quick example of, of what this actually is in practice, right? We know that in many low and middle income countries, sort of national regulatory authorities, they sometimes won't have enough capacity or expertise to be able to assess dossiers for products uh, for registration, right? Uh, also, this process can the process can be quite lengthy, which ends up kind of deterring companies from filing for registration in the first place. There are a lot of things that are already happening and a lot of progress has been made to really streamline those regulatory pathways, right? We have kind of the World Health Organization's collaborative registration procedure. We have uh, obviously countries coming together to really harmonize some of their regulatory requirements, uh, such as the case in the East African community. And there are many ways in which kind of the examples of this collaboration uh, really shows that by enabling the ecosystem to, to, to make it easier or more streamlined, this can be a big enabler for access, right? We also have really good examples of how pharmaceutical companies can work with other partners, right? So for example, when there is little commercial incentive to actually produce and develop treatments for, I don't know, Chagas disease, we do see examples of companies actually working collaboratively with product development partnerships to really develop new business models and approaches. So these treatments actually get developed 
but also they make it into the countries that need them, right? So I think there's a lot of potential and a lot of scope for these types of solutions. And we need to see more of that, right? But I, I guess the deeper question and, and kind of the main question is what is it that we can do as individuals, society? It is one of these problems where, I mean, most of the time it just feels so big. And so it can be a bit, you can feel a bit hopeless actually trying to solve some of these questions, right? But I think we're actually at a critical point uh, in the sense that the COVID-19 pandemic really came to underscore the, the breadth of this inequity, right? It, and for the first time ever, it has put some of these companies, governments and, and, and multiple players under the spotlight. And probably this is a time where I would say civil society has the greatest level of awareness of the role that, that these companies play. And also, some of the challenges that we continue to see. So I think as a society, as individuals, we also have a role to play in demanding more action from industry, from our governments, from the ecosystem in general, to ensure that that access is, is something that becomes um, actually a reality for everyone. <laughs>